I am grateful to be here. I want to thank Miga and Florence for helping me organize this, for all of us organizing it together, for the ESA for hosting this, for all of you for coming. This is amazingly important content. This presentation is a very important moment in the history of entomology. I know that may sound dramatic, but my hope is that by the time you take in all of the content that we're presenting, you may come to see that the discrepancy, the gap between what's being done in the subject and the potential of the subject is stark and uh, arresting. I myself am not a scientist, as I just said, but I share certain things in common with the entomologists who've come to this conference. I believe that the diversity of insects and the crucial roles that they play in ecosystems around the planet create a sense of wonder. And that science is the best way of moving things forward. And of course that the public is sadly misinformed about the many roles that insects play. I really want to talk in this uh, presentation also about confirmation bias. Confirmation bias, as you all know, is the phenomenon by which we do not seek information that conflicts with our worldview. It's as though we have a blind spot. This is as true of scientists as it is for the public. If we're not prepared to see it, we just don't see it. The fact is that scientists, through their training, focus on that risk, that danger. Their training encourages them to challenge confirmation bias. Well, the subject of entomophagy is a very interesting counter pose or a very interesting illustration of confirmation bias because in this case, the science of nutrition and resource utilization represented by insects and other arthropods, well, all the data is in. It's not as though we're avoiding knowing things we don't want to know. Once we know them, we pretend that we don't. Now, to be honest, when I say we, I mean you. Because as I've said, I'm not a scientist. And of course, the subject is not ignored, but it is marginalized and to some extent dismissed. And I have heard a certain amount of testimony explaining that. And I'll be getting into that in a moment. I will first very, very, very briefly run through the advantages and arguments of insects as food. Of course, and of course many of you know this, and you may have even seen the TED Talks given by Dr. Marcel Dika of Wageningen University. Quite recently, in the last uh, two or three or four weeks, his second TED Talk on the use of insects as food came out and has received a certain amount of attention. And there have been some uh, high profile uh, edible insect events as well, and they have received some attention in the press, and I'll be talking about that. So. The, the major points, insects reproduce rapidly, have short life cycles, can be farmed in urban agriculture, can be farmed in high concentrations without the need for antibiotics as we see in vertebrates that are farmed. Insects do not produce any potentially harmful byproducts, unlike for example pig farms that have large and toxic liquid manure lagoons, unlike the salmonella issues that we have with chickens and E. coli from beef. Though some insects are disease vectors, the ones most suited to food production do not harbor anything that humans can catch, except for the occasional allergy, but there's nothing on the order of E. coli, as I just mentioned. There's no mad cricket disease, nothing that transfers to humans. That in itself, the ability of insect production to help us avoid a pandemic is a rather powerful argument, but there are others, of course. Vertebrates raised for food, of course, expend a lot of energy maintaining high body temperatures. Insects do not. Most insects that we might raise do not necessarily require food sources that we ourselves would eat, which means that they're not in competition with us for food, again, unlike our standard animal choices. Of course, the nutritional information you'll be hearing about a good deal. Insects are high in protein. That's what I hear from the public all the time. Yes, but they're also high in vitamins, minerals, amino acids, etc. Last but not least are the aesthetics. Although many, although many Westerners may cringe at eating insects, 
those who are willing to try them report that insects are sometimes neutral in flavor and sometimes quite tasty. A person in the business, a friend of mine in the business, says that the hardest insect to eat is your first one. After that, you start to recognize that the problem with insects was a problem that you had. And of course, insects can be processed in the same way that we prefer fish sticks and chicken nuggets or hamburger to animal parts or you know, protein parts that remind us of the animals. Insect flour and insect uh, products that are processed to remove the appearance of insects are also very, very easy. And you'll be hearing about that as well. Now on to the title of my talk, Why Haven't, main, why haven't Entomology Departments Taken Entomophagy Seriously? The attitude of the academic community regarding entomophagy is not very different from that of the general public. And when I say this, the general public, I admit that I'm mostly referring to the so-called Western attitude public. I need to explain here that I'm not trying, I'm trying not to be ethnocentric. It's just that I'm addressing an audience that deals with an American public and deals with students at American universities, which means that the entomologists at this conference and the way that they view entomophagy will make itself felt in how they express it to the community. And this is what creates the history and the lack of progress for entomophagy. While some academics utilize entomophagy in their classes, that's true, and you'll be hearing about that as well, it's in a fairly perfunctory manner. There are no research funds for this subject. Most of all, entomologists will at times literally warn their students off of pursuing entomophagy or any studies related to insect consumption. How do I know this? Well, because Dr. Florence Dunkel, my co-chair, has told me so. She's heard herself. Professors say, no, 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 you don't want to do that. There's no future in that. No one's going to take you seriously. You're not going to get a job. Is that? Come on. Well, this is, this is really tragic. Perhaps those academics who are saying these things are not aware that it is through their words, it's through saying this, that they are perpetuating prejudice and bias. I don't mean to sound as though I take this personally. It's just that I've spent enough time with this subject that the logic of it, the elegant, simple logic of making food from insects, it just seems obvious. And the fact that it's not obvious to others is one thing, but the fact that scientists are so stubborn about it is what I really want to talk about and communicate today. And of course, when we come to why the academics would really say this, the likeliest answer is cultural baggage, it's cultural conditioning. And that means that the, pre the, prejudice and sciences, the prejudices and biases of scientists themselves are getting in the way, even though scientists are the people who have sworn through their dedication to science to get beyond prejudice and bias. When I reminded Florence of our conversation and told her that I wanted to use the anecdote in my talk, she said, well, you know, yes. And let's remember that there's a historical perspective here. If you take the dynamic of a person in a position of authority saying to someone else, no, that's a bad idea. Well, those same professors who were saying that about entomophagy, some of them were told just the same thing a few decades ago about integrated pest management, biocontrol, organic foods. So we see a pattern of resistance to ideas. Ideas were scorned, but now those same ideas are part of the canon of entomology. They're full disciplines in themselves. Well, that's very interesting. That's an aha moment to see the pattern of resistance to a new idea and adoption of the new idea. And it's an adoption because some people saw the potential and didn't listen when people said, no, 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 you don't want to do that, it's a bad idea. That means that we can recognize that we are somewhere along the progression when it comes to entomophagy itself. That is worth thinking about. Research and development of applied entomophagy would save the lives of those who most need saving. It would also reduce deforestation. It would conserve fresh water. It would reduce
greenhouse gas emissions from livestock flatulence. Our current food production methodologies are incompatible with our population or damaging both individual health and our species best interest. Given that entomologists possess a wide range of applicable expertise, it's a terrible thing that those who would be the future of this subject are being turned away in a multitude of small moments that maintain a status quo. Science could save us if we'd only listen to it. And of course, again, the history of science, not just the history of entomology, history of science is full of discoveries that showed people themselves in a new light and therefore were uncomfortable. The great scientists suffered for their discoveries, and it's possible that entomologists who championed entomophagy might get a little bit of teasing on Fox News or other mainstream media outlets. No one likes to be ridiculed, not individual people and not institutions. But it doesn't change the facts and it doesn't change the future that we're building for ourselves with overpopulation. It, is, it would be tragic if the scientific community continued to drag its heels. Yes, it's true that some say that science cannot trump public policy and the underlying cultural norms. But again, to say that the world, that America, even American society is not ready for entomophagy is itself an assumption. And as I'm about to show you, there are some indicators that this is simply not the case. So I'm gonna show you a range of aspects, a range of new things being done. And uh, here we go. Uh, yeah, here we go. There we go. So this is the graphic uh, that accompanies a Masters of Architecture thesis in Toronto. That uh, previous slide was an urban farm. And this person, uh, Jacob uh, Zamza, I think, uh, he uh, is uh, defending his thesis this week. And it talks about population first. How will we feed all these people? This project is about harnessing food production methodologies in an urban environment. Smaller food print. Food print is one of the two words that you, perhaps you've never seen before. The other word I'll show you, you'll never, ever, ever see again. But food print is a fascinating idea. Our ecological footprint specifically related to food. And if you do any amount of research, or even if you just read Michael Pollan and Eric Schlosser and find their sources, they talk about landscape use and corn production and all of that. I mean, it's, it's really public information at this point. And to some extent, the smaller, smaller food print of insects and other food sources, that's also public information. So this is simply making use of that. Toronto is leading the way in the world's 3MF, third millennium farming revolution. Multicultural population. Uh, city glows green at night. So city is a, the city is a fully sustainable food producing ecosystem. I, don't, I kind of doubt, no offense to Toronto, it's a great city. I don't know if Toronto is that right now, but this is a vision of not just a future Toronto, but a future livable city. That's what we want for our descendants, many of whom we already love because they're our children and nephews, etc. So, uh, moving from that, we have a few papers. In the same way that we have urban farming on a small scale to, to feed the people of a city, well, space stations. You're not going to have vertebrates raised for food in space. So, um, Jun Mitsuhashi, at the uh, right side of the uh, author list, has uh, done a huge amount of work in Japanese use of insects, which is traditional and still extant. The abstract is right there. There are several papers on space agriculture and entomophagy as an application thereof. Here we have nutritional information, 14 species of edible insects in southwestern Nigeria. There is a, an increasingly great uh, large number of papers specifically out of Africa by entomologists working with nutritionists, occasionally working with anthropologists. 
that kind of interdisciplinary approach is wonderful. I don't know if it's an innovation. It certainly would be for American universities around this subject. But it makes a lot of sense. All of these papers I have and would be glad to share. And here we have Julieta Ramos Elordi, whom we've already heard about through Jean, who is one of the most published people in the world. Uh, this is a wonderful paper. It details some fascinating things about the uses of insects in Mexico. It talks about Eskimolis, which are ant pupae. And there's even an amusing anecdote in which Julieta and her team of researchers interviewed some of the kingpins of the edible insect world in Mexico City, and they reported that planes bearing thousands of pounds of ant pupae harvested in Colorado and Utah were making periodic runs into Mexico City and selling at quite a price because the high-end restaurants in Mexico City are doing very, very well, thank you, with ant pupae, grasshoppers, etc. So it's becoming hot cuisine there. And of course, it's pre-Hispanic. When the Spanish came to present-day Mexico City, what did they find? They found cities that were bigger and cleaner than anything in Spain. Why? Well, a lot of reasons. One of them is they didn't have uh, CAFOs. They didn't have, was it, concentrated animal feed uh, operations or something like that. They didn't have liquid manure lagoons. Mm, sounds kind of nice. So, therefore, there is a rekindling, a renaissance of interest in this in Mexico. And they are supplying themselves, to some extent, at the risk of putting species uh, uh, status in danger. And this is not the only situation. There are a few cases around the world of insects being overexploited as a food resource. Uh, this is just one example of the 80 or so news items, most of them real press as opposed to blog. Within the last three or four months, I've archived them all. Happy to share them. This is The Guardian, one of London's papers of records. So, very simple. More and more interest, which means that if the rest of the world is waking up to this, then the academic community can do so also without the fear of being ridiculed. This is part of a lesson plan created through a nonprofit through nature centers in Florida. So they, they create curriculum, which they post for homeschoolers, for groups that come to do activities at the nature center. And here you have something basically geared towards 10 to 12 year olds. Look, what's for dinner? And look, have you ever eaten a bug? Living in the United States, most people will never deliberately eat a bun insect. But you will consume over a pound of insects in your lifetime. Here's another thing. For those of you who are doing outreach, the whole thing about food uh, action levels. Well, it is almost impossible to grow crops in open fields, etc., etc., without getting insects in there. When I tell the public that there are insects in your food, some of them say, why would people put insects in our food? I say, no, 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 you've got it all wrong. No, it's not about putting insect parts in, it's about the impossibility of keeping them out. And there you go, action levels. You will find these facts lifted from the you know, FDA regs all over the place. And this is the kind of thing that I really want you to consider, please. As for the survey that you've gotten, I tried to say some fairly strident things about why entomology and entomology departments are lagging. If you disagree with my assessment or if you have other theories, I'd really like to hear it. As you can see from the sheet, the questions there, the queries are just suggestions. I would ask you please to hang on to those um, sheets until the end of the symposium and then please turn them in if you would like me to keep in correspondence with you, add your email. And your input and creating the dialogue is essential to moving forward. So we're really hoping that you're willing to do your part and chip in some information. Thank you very much.